How's everybody this morning? How's everybody else? All right. All right. Thank you, ma'am. It's a good thing you did, because if you didn't, I would spill it all over myself. I appreciate that. <coughs> um, Diane did already do this a little bit, but um, I do want to introduce my family. Um, just so you know, uh, my wife, her name's Kelly. She hates it when I make her stand up, so I'm going to have you stand up. Um, this is my gorgeous wife. Um, I met her in February of 2016. We got engaged in March of 2016, and we got married in April of 2016. <laughs> People thought we were crazy. We were crazy in love, and we were crazy in love with Jesus. Um, and the way we looked at it is, if God's in it, what's the use in waiting? Um, and so that's why we just went ahead and jumped in with both feet, and we've been traveling all over preaching about Jesus. And I'm so, I don't get a chance to say this enough, but I'm just so thankful. Like, I traveled for a long time by myself all across the country, around the world, um, sharing my story. And there's just something about having that one that's there with you all the time. And she sees things that I don't see. Um, she gives me, not criticism, but she'll say, hey, I saw this, and maybe we could do, th do it this way. And so, like, just having her on my team by my side, y'all, like, and believe it or not, like, she doesn't owe me money. Like, she married me because she wanted to, too. Like, you know, most time people see us, like if they see us in the grocery store, they want to put, like, one of those dividers between groceries because they think there's no way they're two together. Um, but, no, she, she married me on purpose, um, so I'm super thankful for her. And then my next daughter um, is Lily, and she really hates it when I make her stand up. So, Lily, stand up. This is Lily. She is 19. Um, I came into her life when she was 12, and it's been the best years of her life since then. So, <laughs> no, like, what I can tell you about Lily, she's the easiest teenager that's ever existed. Like, just, she's an amazing big sister. Um, sometimes we have to remind her that she's not the third parent, but <laughs> she does a great job uh, with her two younger sisters, and so... The one sitting next to her is Kinley, and Kinley, I'm going to ask if you would stand up. She's going to blush. So this is Kinley, <laughs> and Kinley is 10. I came into her life when she was 2, and she still calls me by what she used to call me when she was 2. She had a hard time saying Jeff when she was 2. She always called me Juff. So to this day, she still calls me Juff. So that's Kinley. And then down on the very end, and she just told me, Daddy, I don't want to stand up. Um, Tessa, if you would, stand up. Come on. I'll, you can stand with me. Okay, she's going to say no. She is the shyest of our crew uh, by far. Um, but her name is Tessa, and she is seven years old, and... She's daddy's little girl, and I don't know, I just, I'm a girl dad, and I love it, and um, as you can see, I'm the only guy in the house, um, and so that's also three weddings in the future, so if y'all want to donate, um, I will take any donations towards those three future weddings, and I have also said in the past, um, I have three daughters and a wife that I love very much. And that God has called me to protect. So um, I have a gun. And I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> and if I have to start a prison ministry from the inside, I'll do that too. So don't mess with my girls. Um, and Diane did already mention this, but I'm going to just give a small plug. Um, this is my book that I wrote how many years ago now? Two, three years ago now? Three. Yeah, Lily keeps up with everything. She's the, the one that just remembers everything. Um, 
But I wrote this book, uh, came out three years ago. It took me seven years to write this um, because the, I was, had started writing it and then somehow, some way, it disappeared like from my computer. I'm like, well, that's weird. So I started over again um, and I got about five chapters in and my wife had been using my computer, my laptop, and so I grab my laptop and I pull it out. I'm going to work some more on it. And I'm like, hey, did you do something with my book? And she's like, no, I was just on there checking my email. And so I looked and looked and looked and looked and could not find it, and it had disappeared again. So I pouted for a little while, maybe a month or two, and then I started again. And this time I was a lot more like Jesus. You know, Jesus saves and so did Jeff. So I made sure I saved my document in multiple places. Um, and so my, this is basically my testimony. And I'm going to share my story this morning, but my book goes into a lot more detail than I have time to go into on a Sunday morning. Um, I didn't write this book to make a lot of money or get famous. Um, and it's working because I'm neither. Um, I haven't made a lot of money and I'm still not famous. But I wrote this book for one purpose. And that was to see people get saved. I just want to see people come to know Jesus, period. And so that was my purpose in writing this book. And so over the years now, we've had, I think, five people who have given their lives to Christ by reading the book. So that's one thing that I tell people a lot of times when I come, because there are certain people that no matter how many times you invite them, for whatever reason, you can't get them to come to church. But sometimes you can get them to read a book. And, like, I put it out there for them. They're going to make a decision. They're going to say yes to Jesus or they're going to say no to him. But they're going to have that option if they read this book. So um, these are $15. We take cash check. I used to say we'd take, you know, your firstborn. But I've already got three daughters. And so, no, I'm good. We're good as far as kids go. And um, somebody was saying, y'all need to have another one. No. Um, if we do, it's an immaculate conception, and um, so, yes. But anyway, um, super excited to be here, and, and just want to share my story with you, and I also, I want to preface it by saying, like, nothing I say is about me, because if it wasn't for Jesus and his love and his faithfulness, like we've already talked about this morning, I was like, gosh, I feel like everybody's preaching everything I was going to say. I could have just got up here and said... Amen. Let's go home, and we could have done it. Um, but it's, it's God's love. It's God's grace. It's God's mercy. It's his faithfulness why I'm able to be here, period. And you'll, and you'll see why. You'll see why. Um, I wasn't born this way. I wasn't born with only one arm. And just out of curiosity, how many of y'all were at that uh, prayer breakfast that morning? One, two, three, four. Um, okay. It hadn't changed a whole lot since then, but, you know, hopefully it's been long enough that you don't remember all the details. And Either way, um, if you get bored, you know, play Angry Birds on your phone or something. I don't know. But um, when I was 18 years old, I was working at a glass factory in my hometown of Laurenburg, North Carolina. And it was me and seven other college students or soon-to-be college students who were working at the factory. And basically, my dad had come to me and, I, well, let me, let me preface it by saying this. Um, I was 18 at the time and I had been working at Taco Bell for two years. Um, I was that guy that when you came through the drive-thru, I was like, welcome to the border, can I take your order? You know, like I would, you know, just do my own little thing like that. But I had been working there for two years. But then when my dad told me that they were looking to hire some people out at the glass factory, um, he said, you know, just for like a summer job, I'm like, well, how much are they paying? And it was like twice what I was getting paid to make tacos. So I'm like, yes, I'll do it. So I was actually working two jobs at the time. Um, I was working at Taco Bell on the weekends, and I was working at the glass factory Monday through Friday. And actually the first week I worked Monday through Saturday because we did overtime on that Saturday. So like I said, there was eight of us college students or soon-to-be college students who had taken our parents' offers up to work at this factory. So they called our team the rats because we went into the dirtiest, nastiest places of the factory and we were cleaning up areas that were just, hadn't been cleaned in a while from what it looked like. So 
in the glass making process, um, they run the glass through a furnace. And if there are any imperfections in the glass, it'll shatter and fall down to the bottom of the furnace. Well, somebody's got to go in there and clean that up, so why not the eight college students? So what they had us doing is we were going in there, getting down on our knees and pushing these long metal rakes inside this furnace. And Judson, how hot is that furnace? 2,700 degrees. Ballpark it. It's hot. That's all you need to know. So they're running the glass through this furnace, and like I said, if it shatters and breaks, it's falling down to the bottom. So we're having to stick these rakes in, pull the rakes out, and then we would take the, a shovel and scoop the broken glass up, and we would end up going and putting it in a dumpster. So we had been doing that the first eight days on the job. Ninth day on the job, they sent us out to an area of the factory called the silos. And this is where the whole glass-making process started. And my friend Judson is here, and I'll introduce him more a little bit later because he, he plays a key role in my story, and that's kind of why he's here. But um, the silos is where the glass-making process started. And they have this powdery-type substance that they would drop onto a conveyor belt, and that started the whole process. Well, they would drop this powdery-type substance onto this conveyor belt for years and years and years and years. Well, when it would hit the conveyor belt, the dust would billow up and settle on the floor. You know, people were walking in that area, walking on it, packing it down. You know, in some areas, it's like three, four inches thick. And so what our job was, was to go in with these shovels, bust this debris up, load it into machine, or load it into wheelbarrows, and from there, we would run it from our job site to this machine called a screw auger where we would dump the debris in. And then the screw auger, when you dump the debris in, the screw auger would push it up a shaft and then into a dumpster on the opposite end. So when we're working, you can have one of four jobs. You have a shovel in your hand busting the debris up. You are one of the guys, we had two wheelbarrows, and you're either, you could be one of the guys running the wheelbarrows back and forth from our job site to the auger and back. There was another guy who stood at the base of the screw auger, and his job was to make sure everything went down into the auger the way it was supposed to. And then there was another guy at the opposite end of the auger that when the debris would fall out, he would take a shovel or a rake and push everything to the back of the dumpster so it all didn't pile up under the opening. So we had been working all day, and I either had a shovel in my hand all day or I was running the wheelbarrow back and forth. We went on our lunch break, and when we came back, somebody, I can't remember which one, but one of the guys said, hey, why don't everybody just switch jobs? Because some of the jobs were harder than others. I mean, the easier ones were standing down by the auger because you weren't having to do as much physically as you did with the other ones. So when they said, everybody, let's kind of rotate jobs, I was now the guy standing at the base of the screw auger. And again, my job is make sure everything goes down okay. They didn't say if it doesn't go down okay, this is what you do. They just said make sure it goes down okay. So the very first load that we did um, when we came back from lunch, the guy that I played baseball with my entire life, he comes, dumps a load into the auger, and he turns around and heads, heads back off to the job site. Well, I'm looking down into the auger, and let me pause it here for a second. How many people in here know what a screw auger is? Okay, a few. All right, how about this? How many people know what a screw is? Okay, a couple more people. How many people, you're not going to raise your hand no matter what question I ask? <laughs> There's always a few, always a few. Um, if you don't know what a screw auger is, it's basically a giant screw um, that's, that goes up a shaft. And so as the screw, that giant screw turns, the debris or whatever, a lot of times they're used on farms, but that debris gets caught in the threads of that auger, and so it pushes everything up, and then it would dump it out on the other side. So, like I said, my buddy comes up, dumps a load in, he turns around, the head's back off. Well, I look down into the auger, and I can see there was one piece of debris that was about this big, and it was too big to fit down into the threads of the auger the way it was supposed to. So, again, my job is make sure everything goes down okay, like I said, they didn't say, if it doesn't go down okay, this is what you do. They said, just said, make sure it goes down okay. They also didn't tell me that, or tell any of us, that all of the safety equipment had been removed from this piece of machinery. There was supposed to be like a grating over the opening where you dump the debris in, and it would prevent that problem because 
they took it off because they said it slowed the process down so much because when you would dump it in, then you'd have to like break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces so it would fit down into the auger. So they had taken that off, like I said, because they it, said it slowed the process down too much. And then there was supposed to be a, 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 a string that went up and down the side of the machine called a kill switch, right? A emergency pull cord. And uh, Justin, you should just get a seat and come sit here next to me. Um, but if anything starts to go wrong, you pull that cord and it will immediately turn the machine off. Well, that had been removed as well. Yeah, it wasn't Judson's fault. It wasn't his job at the time. Um, so, like I said, that very first load, guy dumps it in, he heads off back, back down, and I'm looking down into the auger, and I can see that there's just one piece of debris that's just not going down the way it's supposed to. And so <laughs> when I got the job, my dad told me, he said, listen, it took me 23 years to earn a good reputation out here. Don't you come ruin it in one summer. I'm like, yes, sir, I got you. And so my whole thought process is get the job done. My job is make sure everything goes down okay. So I can see that, that the auger is still turning underneath that big piece of debris, but it's not going down. So what I decided to do was reach in and grab that piece, take it out, bust it on the ground, pick the pieces back up, and put them back in the auger. Well, I had on, we were all wearing gloves that day called gauntlet gloves, and this is basically identical to the one that I was wearing that day. And when I reached in, I felt a tug. And when I did, I just jerked back as hard as I could with both hands. And obviously my left arm came out fine and my right arm didn't. And what had happened was you can kind of see right there on the edge of the glove where that navy blue piece is. That's how close I was to being okay. But what had happened was the thread of that auger caught that corner of my glove and the auger didn't stop. As you can imagine, the auger is rotating. Now, I'm not going to go into any more details because over the years, I've had 12 or 13 people pass out as I've shared my story. So I'm just going to ask you all this morning, please don't do that because um, it's rude and a little bit distracting. Uh, no, but <laughs> I'll just give you enough details. You can already figure out what's happening at this point. So basically, I'm... I'm getting pulled into the machine, and um, so I started screaming, one, because it hurt, and two, because I wanted somebody to come turn the machine off, because at this point, I'm getting pulled headfirst into the machine. So the guy who was on the other end of the auger, he comes running down a flight of stairs, runs around, turns the machine off. At this point, I'm about six inches to a foot from being completely headfirst into the machine. Um, he gets the machine turned off. I pull myself out. And, um, yeah, part of me was missing. And I'll just leave it at that. So the guy who turned the machine off, he's kind of standing there staring at me. And then he just turns around and takes off running. And I was like, dude, where are you going? Like, you know, I, I got one arm here. I could use a little bit of help, but he just took off. I'm like, well, I don't know where he's going, but I don't want to be by myself. So I took off running after him. Um, <laughs> not the smartest thing to do when you're losing a lot of blood is to take off running. But I'll be honest, I had never read a book on what to do if you have your arm ripped off by a machine. And so I was kind of winging it, just trying to figure out as I went. So I start running, and as I was running, I'm like, where are we going? And then I remembered there was an office 50 to 75 yards away from where our job site was. And I was like, well, I don't know where he's going, but that's where I'm going because I was hoping there would be somebody there that could help me. And if not, I was hoping there was... A, I knew there was a phone in the office that we could call for help. So I run through the bottom of the silos, up a flight of stairs, through a door, and then I run up to this window, and it's this big plate glass window, and I can see three guys in the office. Now, I didn't run up to the window and knock. I didn't open the door and say, hey, does anybody in here have a Band-Aid or anything like that? Like, I literally just ran up to the window, and I just stood there looking in. Um... I was in a little bit of shock at this point, you know, as you can imagine. And so one of the guys looks up at me, and the other two guys in the office say, we can't go out there. Like, they were the ones that can't handle the sight of blood. My guess is if they would have come out there, they would have passed out on top of me. Things would have got worse. It would have been a little weird. Um, so the other guy said, I'll go out there, 
but listen for me. If I need some help, just listen for... So he comes out and he tackles me down on the ground. Seemed a little aggressive at the time, but he told me, he said, you were in so much shock, I was scared that if I didn't get you on the ground that you were going to take off running again. So he gets me down on the ground and he starts yelling at the guys in the office, I need paper towels. So he said the office door opens and a hand comes out holding one paper towel. Super helpful. These are the guys that you want if you have your arm ripped off. So he takes the paper towel, puts it on my arm, and it immediately soaks through with blood. So he yells at him again, I need more paper towels. Again, the door opens. A hand comes out holding one paper towel. So he said, I need the hole. And then he said some words you don't say in church, roll. Um, so one of the guys ripped the paper towels off the wall, pass it out the door, and he basically just starts wrapping my arm in paper towels. One of the next guys that got to me was actually the last baseball coach I ever had. Um, he was in the Navy, and there was just certain things I guess he learned while he was in the Navy, and he became a human tourniquet for a while um, because he came and knelt down beside me, and he took his hand, and he stuck it under my arm and just squeezed as hard as he could, you know, just trying to slow my blood loss. One of the next people that got to me was my dad. He had been um, in a meeting in the front office when the call went out that one of the college students had been hurt. And so everybody with the ability to help starts working their way out there, including my, my good buddy Judson. Um, so everybody's on their way out there trying to do whatever they can. So my dad comes up and he stands above my head and he had his work pager on his hip. And I remember watching him. He took his work pager off and he turned around and he threw it as hard as he could up against the wall and just shattered it. And then my dad just kind of walked off. And you might be thinking, why would he do that? Well, my dad was in shock at this point, too. We had just been having lunch 20 minutes before this happened. So my dad walks, walks off, and then Judson shows up. And Judson comes, in, and he is standing right above my head. So I'm laying on the ground looking up at the ceiling, and Judson's standing right above my head looking down at me. And I remember seeing him start taking his belt off. And I was like, hang on, Judson, it's not that kind of party, man. Um, keep your pants on, you know, <laughs> but... What he was doing, he was playing a key role in saving my life that day because he took his belt off and he wrapped it around my arm and just cinched a tourniquet in absolutely as tight as he could. So, like, I owe my life to that man right there. Him and Jesus. Like, <laughs> like <clears throat> and the funny thing is, is now, like, Judson is still the safety manager. He wasn't the safety manager at the time. He took the safety manager position because of my accident. He's been offered promotions numerous times, and he's turned every single one of them down because he said he never wants an accident like mine to happen at that factory again. Like, that is a man of class and character right there that you don't see very often. So he said God gives us the talent, and he does, but you did what you were supposed to do at the same time, so that's why I give you your credit as well. Um, so Judson gets that tourniquet cinched in tight around my arm. At that point, my old baseball coach walks over to my dad because they were good golf buddies, and he said, hey, hey, buddy, Jeff needs you. So my dad comes back over, and he kneels down beside me, and he grabs my hand, and he said, let's pray. So laying there on the floor of the factory together, uh, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Judson, on his way out to the silos, he had already called ahead to the hospital or the EMTs or whoever, and said, hey, get a helicopter in the air because he knew that our local hospital wasn't going to be able to handle a case like mine. So an ambulance pulls in. They load me up. They take me to our local hospital. When I get there, that's when, you know, my family starts to show up, my mom and stepdad, my, my grandparents, everybody's, you know, all of my mom's praying church friends, like they're all there in the, the waiting room at the emergency room, and you know, my parents come back and see me, and um, then they load me up onto a gurney, and they're taking me out to the helicopter. And it was at that, that moment when I heard them say that they were taking me to Duke University Medical Center. Well, if you don't know me very well, I'm a North Carolina Tar Heel fan. So, so the last place I wanted to go was Duke University Medical Center. you got to be a Tar Heel fan, aren't you? I knew it. I could tell you knew Jesus. Um, 
So I'm like, if they find out I'm a Carolina fan, they'll kill me. Do we have any Duke fans in here? Okay, so my wife does too. My wife works at Duke, but she's not a Duke fan. We'll let Duke give us their money. I'm fine with that. Okay, if you are a Duke fan, after the end of service, we'll, we'll pray for you. Um, move you from that dark blue to that light blue. Because um, the way I look at it, what's that? See, that's the thing is like, people are, I, I, I'm a believer, so I want nothing to do with the devil. I don't care if he's blue, red, green, or purple. I don't want anything to do with the devil, so I'm a Tar Heel fan because I love Jesus. So anyway, so they take me out, load me up on the helicopter, and fly me up to Duke University Medical Center. Well, by the time I get there, I had lost three-fourths of my blood. Um, so just, you know, not doing real well. And so they take me into um, the operating room, and I remember them giving me the anesthesia to put me to sleep for surgery. And they had me strapped down to the table, and I didn't really understand, but they told me, you know, we're giving you this anesthesia. And I remember as they were giving it to me, I got scared. I was scared that if I closed my eyes, they would never open again. So I started trying to get up off the table, but... I was strapped down. I wasn't going anywhere. So they told me, count backwards from 100. And I was like, whoa. And that's about as far as I got. And I was out. And then I was in surgery for, I always forget this number, every single time. It was either 11 or 13 hours. It's in the book. Uh, but I was in the surgery for 11 or 13 hours. And two times while I was in surgery, uh, my heart rate plummeted. Like they started losing me. My heart rate was steady in the 60s, but twice it dropped down into the 20s. Um, so that it dropped down. They gave me this medication, got my heart rate back up. And about five minutes later, my heart rate plummeted again. And they gave me this medication and my heart rate came back up again. And that's where like God can work things out. My wife is a nurse. So she was able to go back and read all of my records and everything that's in the book, if it talks about anything medical, it's from that lady right there. She was able to like, oh, this is what was happening there and this is what was happening there. So, um, But they were trying to figure out if there was a way that they could reattach my arm because my arm got really mangled as it went through the machine um, and there was nothing they could do with it. But because of where the, the auger had grabbed my glove my hand was perfectly fine. Like the first injury to my arm was like right in this area, so, but my hand made it through the machine perfectly fine. And so the doctors came out to talk to my family when they're in the waiting room and they said, we're not going to be able to save Jeff's arm. It's too mangled. They said, but his hand made it all the way through the machine with no issues. So if you want... We can just take his hand and just smack it on the end of his arm. Well, they probably didn't say smack. They probably would have said like attach or something. And my family was like, well, okay. Um, well, will he be able to use that hand? And they said, well, probably not, but it's never been done before. That's true. Well, I'm kind of thinking there's a reason that it's never been done before. Like... <laughs> Did they expect me to walk around, you know, clapping like a seal and like, you know, like if I would have woke up with a hand right here, I would have been extremely upset. And if I was, I'd want to hit somebody. If I was going to hit it with my right hand, they'd have had to be real close to me. But like, so what they, what they did was, um, I'm thankful for this because they didn't have to do skin grafts from all over in my body. They cut the palm of my right hand off and they put it over the end of my arm, which, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm thankful that they weren't having to graft skin from all over my body. So, like I said, I was in surgery for 11 hours, 13 hours, I don't know. Um, and I was in the hospital for 16 days because before my accident, I was right-handed. And people tell me, well, now you're left-handed. I'm like, well, actually, I'm only handed, you know, but whatever. Um, and it seemed like every day when I was in the hospital, I was learning something new that I couldn't do. You know, like having to learn how to brush my teeth with my left hand after having done it my entire life with my right hand and, you know, having to learn how to eat with my left hand, having to learn how to get dressed with only one hand, all these different kinds of things. And I started dealing with some anger issues while I was in the hospital. It even took me a while to learn how to walk because I was lopsided because this side was now heavier than this side. 
So I actually learned how to walk by leaning up against the wall and just pushing myself down the wall. And so, like I said, I was in the hospital for 16 days. And then when I got out of the hospital, I started college 16 days later. I still didn't have the ability to write because, you know, and this was back before everybody was carrying around laptops and all that kind of stuff. So I had to teach myself how to write my first year of college. And so when I got out of the hospital, I started dealing with all kinds of anger issues, depression, suicidal thoughts, like, as you can imagine, because my whole life, the only thing I ever wanted to do was play college baseball. That's all I ever wanted to do. And I was four days from my college orientation when I lost my arm. So if you had two arms, I didn't like you. I mean, just being honest, like, if I saw somebody with two hands, I was jealous. Um, when I would get ready in the morning, I would look in the mirror and I would slide all the way over until the mirror would cut me off right here so I didn't have to look at that side of my body. Like, I hated looking in the mirror. I hated it. And this is the kind of stuff that I was dealing with. Um, and I went to, I started off at a local college. It's um, called the University of North Carolina at Pembroke now. Back then it was called Pembroke State. I went to Pembroke State for one semester, and I was only doing that because, like, I was having so many follow-up doctor's appointments and surgeries and things like that that it wouldn't make sense. I was supposed to be going off to App State. Um, but so after my first semester, I transferred up to Appalachian State where I was supposed to be going to begin with, and my roommate there was a guy I played baseball with my entire life. But he was one of those guys who was just good at every sport he played, and he was actually on a football scholarship at Appalachian. And so uh, because he was a football player, I got to be friends with a lot of the other football players. And so um, they, didn't, they didn't see me as handicapped. You know, and I don't see myself as handicapped. Like, yes, it's probably going to take me twice as long to tie my shoes, but it takes me half as long to wash my hands, you know. So some, some ways it balances out. Um, but any time they were going to go do something, they would always invite me to go with them. So one day they were going to go play basketball, and they said, Jeff, do you want to go play? And I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And so we get to the gym there at Appalachian State, and at App State there were these four full-court basketball courts with a track that went around it that people walk and run on. And so when we get there, everybody's just kind of shooting, warming up before the game starts. And, you know, we needed ten players because we were going to run a full-court game. So I started counting to see how many players there were. And there were 11. I said, that means one person's not going to get picked. I wonder who that's going to be. And so I looked around. I was really hoping there was a guy there with no arms, but, you know, there wasn't. <laughs> and so when they picked teams, I didn't get picked. And so I just went off on another goal, and I was over there just shooting by myself. I would watch them play for a little while, then I would shoot a little while. And like I said, it, there's this, this track going around all the courts. And so I'm standing there shooting, and this is what would typically happen. People would walk by my court and they would look up at me and then they'd look back down and then they would look back and they would stare at me as they walked past my court. And I get it. It's not every day you see a one-armed guy shooting basketball. So, I, you know, I understand that it's not an everyday thing. But that was typically, that was what happened. I got that initial look, look back down, then the stare. And then after that, they never really paid any attention to me. Except for this one girl. When she got to my court the first time, she looked at me. And then she looked back down, and she looked back up, and she stared at me the entire time she walked by my court. I'm like, again, I get it. It's not every day you see a one-armed guy shooting basketball. Well, then the next time she gets to my court, as soon as she gets to my court, she starts staring, and she stares at me the entire time she walks past my court. I'm like, I'm not going to do any tricks, you know. I'm not going to do, like, any one-handed cartwheels. And I, I promise you I'm not going to do any two-handed cartwheels. Um, but l literally every time she got to my court, she would stare me down. And, I mean, and walk slower to the point she's almost walking backwards. I'm like, come on, like you're in college. This shouldn't be that big a deal to you. And so I started getting mad, and I wanted to be like, you know, come get you some. But <laughs> at the same time, I didn't want to get beat up by a girl, so I didn't do that. But I'm like, why, why is she staring at me so much? And then after a little while, the guy in me kicked in, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, maybe she's checking me out, you know? That's what I was thinking. She wasn't, um, but at the time I didn't know that, but I was thinking, you know, well, maybe she's checking me out. Well, 
I had been shooting kind of around the free throw line, and so I decided to go over closer to the baseline where it'd be a little bit closer to the track. So if she wanted to come talk to me, she could. And so the very first time I moved over by the baseline, she came walking up to me. And you know how when you're talking to somebody and you can tell they really want to ask you a question and like the question I always get, how'd you lose your arm? You know, that's what I get asked that so many times. Um, but I could tell she wanted to ask me a question. And so she goes, would you like to go to church with me sometime? And I was thinking, no, not at all. Because the thing is, at that time, I was mad at God. Because I thought God had taken my arm. Now that was my own ignorance. Because we know what the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10. Y'all can probably quote it. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. I didn't know that at the time. I thought God had taken my arm, so I was mad at God. I had a, I, I tell people I had a shouting match with God. I really didn't because he didn't shout back, thankfully. But I remember sitting in the parking lot of what was the Harris Teeter in Boone, North Carolina, yelling at God. I, I, I served you my whole life, and this is how you treat me? Like, I was so mad. And I, I, there are probably people in here right now who are upset with God, and I'll tell you this right now. If something in your life has been stolen, killed, or destroyed, that's not God. You're blaming the wrong one. God gets blamed for everything, and he gets credit for nothing. If something good happens, oh man, that's good luck right there. If something bad happens, God, why would you do this to me? So if you're upset with God, it shouldn't be that way. He is so good and so faithful. And people are like, well, how can, how can you say that after what happened to you? You'll find out. But when she asked me, she said, do you want to go to church with me? Like, I knew the answer was no. Like, it was either no or heck no or some other kind of version of But the answer was no. But she said, would you like to go to church with me sometime? I said, sure. And I'm like, why the heck did I say sure? Like, the answer was no. But I'm one of those people that, you know, once I tell you something, I, I'm going to try to follow through on it. But I want to share something here with you because when I was uh, messaging back and forth with Pastor Ina, um, who's just a sweetheart of a lady, by the way, like, just, I like you. I know this is the first time I've met you, but I like you. You know, you're likable. I can't say that about every church I go to, but you are so likable. She's just so friendly and stuff. But anyway, that was a plug for Anna being likable. Um, but what I want you to see is a verse here. Let me ask you this. How many people in here have been to Bible college? Okay, so a few of you. Do you know y'all are all called to ministry? Now let me ask you a question. How many people in here have ever accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Did you know that you're all called to ministry? We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And it says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I'm not super intelligent, as y'all probably figured out by now, but when I saw ministry of reconciliation, I was like, what does that mean? You know, it's kind of like my brother who was up here this morning um, talking about Psalm 91 um, and just how you've read something but you never really got it. I'm like, what does that mean? And so I looked it up and reconciliation means to bring into a changed relationship. So as believers, we have the ministry of reconciliation, which is our ministry is to bring people into a changed relationship with their heavenly father. That girl who came up and invited me to church, and then I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second, it took her 13 laps to build up the courage because the first time she looked at me, God spoke to her and said, go invite him to church. 
So every time when she came to my court and she would stare me down, she was hoping that I would strike up a conversation. But it took her 13 laps to build up the courage to finally come up and invite me to church. I'll tell you this. In my lifetime, this is sad. In my lifetime, not one person has ever witnessed to me. I've been invited to church maybe two or three times, but not once has anybody cared enough about my eternal destiny to come up and share Jesus with me. We live just outside of Graham, North Carolina, just outside of Hillsboro. We live in a town called Hall River. Um, and I was in downtown Graham one day, and the Jehovah's Witnesses were set up on the corner. And I had to walk past them uh, to go where I was going. I walked past them and looked at them. They didn't say anything to me. I'm like, that is, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, it's in the name. <laughs> like, witnesses is in the name. Witness to me. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try again. So I turned around and went back by them. They didn't speak to me. They didn't offer me a track. Nothing. I'm like, maybe Jehovah's Witnesses don't like one-armed guys. I don't know. But, like, even the Jehovah's Witnesses did not witness to me. In my lifetime, nobody has ever witnessed to me. There are statistics that talk about the amount of believers, the percentage of believers that share their faith. And the numbers are sad. If I'm not mistaken, it's like 10% of believers. At the most, 20% of believers will share their faith with somebody. And in their lifetime, only 5% of believers will lead somebody to Christ. So one day, I have a, a message I do completely on witnessing and my wife and I were talking, you know, because I'm one of those people when, that when, if I preach a message, I want it to be like, whoever's listening, they walk out of church knowing exactly what to do with the message that they were preached. And one of the things, I think the reason why most people do not witness is because of fear. They don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want, what if it makes the other person uncomfortable? But this is what I'll have to say about that. I can handle a moment of being uncomfortable if it will keep somebody eternally from burning in hell. Change your perspective. Oh, gosh. I'm looking at her. I don't, I don't think she's saved. But I, gosh, that makes me super uncomfortable to go over there and talk to her. Well, she's going to be super uncomfortable burning in hell for eternity because I didn't have the boldness to go up and share Jesus with her. And a lot of you sitting here right now, you had a face or a name come to mind. And that's the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, go talk about Jesus to that person. And it's funny that Pastor Ina is going to be preaching or doing Psalm chapter 2 um, because a verse I pray every time before I preach is Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So anytime I get up to preach or if I'm going out to witness to somebody, ask the Lord. I ask the Lord for part of that inheritance. Lord, I thank you for part of that inheritance as I go out and witness today. So that was just something I wanted to share. It's something you can ask my family. I've never done that before. I've never thrown that part in. But we need to take the witness stand. There are people out there that are dying and going to hell. My wife found out this morning that one of her former co-workers was killed last night in a motorcycle accident in, in Durham. Like, Somebody bumped into her on their motorcycle. She got off, was picking her motorcycle up, and somebody else came by, hit her, and took off. But that fast, out of, out of curiosity, 
Who plans on dying today? Oh, nobody? You think I planned on having my arm ripped off when I was 18? If something hadn't changed, if people are dying and going to hell and we're doing nothing about it, we've got to do, like in all four Gospels, we are told what to do as believers. That's our job. That's your ministry. You have the ministry of reconciliation. Back to the testimony. So she invites me to church. I say, sure. I show up at the church, and honestly, it looked a lot like this. I was raised Methodist. Any other former Methodists here? All right. <laughs> now, my mom is still Methodist, but my mom is a Methecostal. Um, I know Methecostals. I know Bapticostals. I don't think I know any Presbycostals, um, but like I know a lot of Costals. Um, but in my, I grew up in a church where on this side was the piano and on that side was the organ. And during, when they would play, I guess they called it praise and worship, um, you'd start on this side and they'd play the piano and then halfway through the service, the pianist would get up and walk around to the other side and finish on the organ. That was just kind of how they did it in the Methodist church, you know. But one thing I... I had never been into a church where I saw like musical instruments. So I'm thinking, they must have had a concert in here last night or something. You know, I hadn't seen, but like when service starts, like I'm sitting in the middle of all the college students and I called it the fast music, slow music. I didn't know it was called praise and worship. So they started the fast music. What Literally every student around me is jumping up and down. And I'm like, what is going on in here? <laughs> but I'm the weird one because I'm the only one not jumping. So I'm like, all right. So I just kind of, my toes never left the ground, but I'm like, I'll give you this much, you know. So then the fast music stopped and the slow music started, and then everybody's hands go up in the air. And I was like, I didn't even hear the question. Like, so I'm like, okay. So I did one of these. I went, I'm like, I've got my hand up, so I'm not the weird one, the only one without a hand. So I put my hand up. I said, but. They can't see my hand, so hopefully they won't call on me because I don't know what the question is, much less the answer. Now, little did I know, everybody around me knew the answer. The answer. But I didn't know him, but I was about to. Um, because <laughs> right after that, a missionary gets up, and he was a missionary from Africa. And he had been in Africa forever. Like, I'm pretty sure he invented Africa. Like, that's how long <laughs> he had been a missionary in Africa. And so... He gets up and he starts talking about all the amazing things he'd seen God do on the mission field. He's like, I've seen dead people raised to life. And I'm like, I don't care. Because I'm mad at God. I am so mad at God. I'm mad at myself for being in church at that point. He's like, I've seen dead people raised to life. I was like, I don't care. He's like, I've seen blind eyes opened. And I was like, I don't care. He's like, I've seen deaf people able to hear again. I was like, I don't care. He's like, I've seen arms grow out. I was like, well, I do kind of care about that. You know, <laughs> now this guy's got my attention because I'm like, I'm mad at a God because I thought he took my arm and he's talking about a God that gives them back. So now he's got my full attention because I'm, what I had decided was, okay, I'm getting my arm back tonight. It's a four-hour drive home so I can show my mom and my stepdad my new arm. Now, I don't want y'all to think that that's what happened, and then I, like, lost my right arm again. You know, like, man, he's really bad with right arms. Like, that's not what happened, but something much cooler happened because, like, now he has my undivided attention because I'm trying to figure out what I have to do to get my arm back. So he starts talking about the goodness of God, John chapter 10, verse 10, things like that, and I started thinking, I was like, gosh, the God that I'm mad at and the God that he's talking about, they don't really seem to match. It's like, I, I like the God that he's talking about. And so at the end of the service, he gave an altar call. You know, anybody in here, if you'd like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, come forward. So he said that the girl who had invited me to church, she's sitting next to me, and she leans over, and she goes, are you a Christian? And I was like, yeah, I think so. Now, this is a guy who's mad at God, yelled at him, told God I was done with him. You go your way, I'll go mine. She goes, are you a Christian? I was like, yeah, I think so. And I'm so thankful she asked me this. She's like, how do you know? I was like, well, I went to church three years in a row, didn't miss a Sunday. 
like literally. I have a pen at home. I, I meant to bring it today. It's literally that big. It's a little cross. Three years in a row, and I didn't miss a Sunday. I said, I used to be the president of our church's youth group. Before that, I was the vice president of our church's youth group. I used to speak at church, which meant I was in the Christmas and Easter plays, but, you know. But she noticed that the one thing I didn't say was Jesus. I gave her all of my qualifications and none of them mattered. She said, would you like to go forward just to be sure? And I was like, yeah, it won't hurt. So I got up, I went forward. There was probably 20 to 25 of us. And again, I was raised Methodist. I had never seen a prayer line before. I had seen an altar on this side and an altar on this side. You come up, you put your knees down, you pray. Sometimes somebody will pray with you. Most of the time they won't. You get up and you go back to your seat. Well, this was a prayer line. Like I didn't even see anywhere where I was supposed to kneel because they had at my church they had that padding so your knees didn't hurt. So I'm like, I don't see any padding. And so everybody else is standing up. I was like, I guess I'll stand up too. So I'm standing there. He leads us in the sinner's prayer. And he goes, now I want to come down and pray for each one of you individually. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I was all the way down at the far end on, the, on this side. And he comes down and starts praying on that end. Well, I didn't know about prayer line etiquette. You know, when you're standing in a prayer line, you either stand there with your hands up or your hands down, with your eyes closed or looking forward. I didn't know that. So when he went down there, I wanted to see what was going on. So I kind of stepped forward and like peeked. And I saw him walk up and he put his hands on the first person's head. And I immediately stood back up. I said, God, please don't let him touch me. Because at that time, after I lost my arm, I was very, very weird about people touching me. I didn't, like, you stay over there, I'll stay over here. Don't touch me. I, I could get claustrophobic really easily. It's like, so just don't touch me. And so he's working his way down the line. I'm like, all right, God, like I know you and I just got cool and everything, but like please don't let him touch me. So like now he's like two people down. I'm like, well, maybe if I close my eyes, he won't see me. So I close my eyes. <laughs> and sure enough, now he's in front of me, and he puts his hands on my head. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground. And I was thinking, he seemed like such a nice man. And he just pushed me down on the ground in church like, why would he lead me to Jesus and then throw me down on the ground? Like, Now, I didn't know. I, <laughs> you definitely didn't see that in the Methodist church, I promise you. But, but I, I didn't know. I had never seen anybody that sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes on them so strong, like you don't have an option of standing or not. It's kind of like when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was like, I am, and everybody laid out. It's not like they're like, okay, Jesus, you said that. I'm going to lay down now. No, they were out. Well, that's what happened to me. So I'm laying there on the ground and why would he push me down? Like he, seemed like, he seemed so nice. Why would he push me? So I'm laying on the ground, and now I'm really embarrassed because I'm like, that was one thing my mom always told me when I was at church, is get up off the floor because I was like <laughs> crawling under the pews and that kind of stuff. So I'm laying there on the floor with my eyes closed, but I hear something like really close to my head over here. So I roll my head over, and I open this eye, and I was like, oh, there's somebody laying next to me. So I close that eye. I roll my head over to this side, and I open this eye up, and there's somebody laying next to me over here. I'm like, I guess that's just what they do at this church, you know. <laughs> we'll lay here, and then the buzzer will go off, and we'll all get up and go back to our seats or whatever. Like, I'm telling y'all, I had no clue what was happening. But I, when I got up, the guy who went forward and the guy who went back to his seat were two completely different people. My life changed in an instant. Like... Like, I literally felt like when I was walking back to my seat, like I was almost floating because I was burdened with so much like depression and anger and just suicidal thoughts and all this kind of stuff. Like I literally felt like I was hunched over and now I felt like, like I was being lifted. Like it was just an amazing thing. And so I started going to a campus ministry there at Appalachian State and um, started learning about who I was in Christ and just learning, just reading my Bible every morning and just learning things. And um, there was one time that we were going to, the, the people who attended New Life uh, were going to go to a, like a youth camp and we were going to be like counselors and stuff like that. And I hadn't been saved very long, but I told them I would go. But my plan was to just lean up against the wall the whole time. Like 
I'll watch what everybody else does. I have no intentions of getting involved. And I was doing a great job. Like that wall did not fall one time. I leaned right up against it and it stayed until the leader of, of our group said, hey, Jeff, will you share your testimony tonight? And I said, if you tell me what a testimony is, I'll share it. Because I didn't know what a testimony was back then. I knew like testifying in court, but I didn't know testifying about Jesus. He, he said, just talk about what Jesus has done in your life. I was like, okay, I can do that. So I got up in front of 200 kids, first time I'd ever spoken when it wasn't a class assignment. I was so nervous I could not hold the microphone. I would have given myself a black eye. I was shaking so bad. So the guy who had asked me to share my testimony, he stood next to me and held the microphone in front of my mouth. And so I don't remember what I said, but when I got done, the guy's name was Rick. There's a chapter in my book about him. He took the mic and he said, you heard what Jesus did in Jeff's life. If you'd like him to do the same for you, come on forward. And out of those 200 people, kids that were there, one 13-year-old boy sitting in the very back corner gets up, comes down, and gives his life to Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever prayed a prayer that you didn't realize was a prayer until later on in life, but I guess it was a prayer. I said, God, that was really cool. If you want me to do it again, I will. And that was in November of 1996. And we've been going ever since. <clears throat> But everything I said revolves around what I'm about to tell you right now. I was asked to speak in an event in May of 1997 in Taylorsville, North Carolina. I had never been to Taylorsville. I didn't know where it was. I still don't know where it is. It's in North Carolina is all I know. But like a friend of mine in college, she was doing a, an event in her hometown. And she was going to have a few speakers. The guy speaking before me, I don't know if any of y'all remember him. His name was Robert Brickey. He played uh, basketball at Duke University. Um, so I forgave him for that. But he, he spoke just before me, and then they had to get a Carolina fan up to fix everything he had messed up. Um, but he spoke before me. But, like, I was such a baby Christian. I showed up to speak that day, and somebody came up, and they are like, what are you going to talk about? And I was like, I have no idea. I had planned nothing. This is how holy I was. I didn't even have my Bible with me. I mean, I'm, I'm killing it, y'all. I'm telling you, I was doing such a great job. Um, so I asked my friend if I could borrow her Bible. So she hands me, literally, she hands me her pink Bible. And I, <laughs> I go running out to a picnic table, and I sit down. And I'm like, God, what am I supposed to talk about? I'm flipping back and, God, I'll preach on the table of contents or the book of maps if you just tell me, like... I'll preach on whatever. And so I'm sit I literally flipped through my Bible. And at this point, I had my Bible sitting there like this. And I had my arm laid across the Bible. And I, then at one point, I just kind of sat back. And the pages of the Bible start turning. And I just look at it. And, but I have no idea what's going on. I'm like, God, please tell me what to talk about. And then all of a sudden, I notice that the pages of the Bible stop turning but the wind is still blowing. So I'm like, okay. So it stopped in Job chapter 32. So I was like, okay, God wants me to preach on Job. Or I think I called him Job at the time. <laughs> um, so I start reading it, and I'm like, I don't understand. Like, none of this makes any sense. And when you leave, go read the end of Job chapter 32. I read the whole chapter, and the only thing that mattered was really the last two verses. It basically said, the words are already within you, and the Spirit will compel you what to say. And that moment, man, I was excited. And somebody's like, they came up to me like, aren't you one of the speakers? I'm like, yeah. They're like, what are you going to talk about? I was like, I don't know, but it's going to be good. You know, because, you know, I just knew then that the Holy Spirit was going to tell me what to say. So right at the beginning of service, there was a table set up right over here with seven candles on it. And they started lighting those seven candles. And so the girl who had invited me to speak, she was sitting next to me. So I leaned over and I was like, why are they lighting those candles? And she had said in the last six months at that time, they had had seven teenagers die by either suicide or car accident. So they lit each one of those candles for them as like a memorial. And so I was like, okay. So I stood back up, and the next thing I know, I started crying. And that was really unusual for me because I was never one to cry very much. Like the first time I cried after I lost my arm 
was when I'd been in the hospital for five days and I cried because I knew I wasn't going to get to play baseball anymore. And so I'm sitting there crying and before long I went from crying to sobbing uncontrollably. I sat down and I had my head between my knees and I was bawling my eyes out. And even though I was still a baby Christian, I knew that God was dealing with me about something. So I prayed this really deep spiritual prayer. It's in the Bible somewhere. Um, I said, God, what's up? I mean, that's pretty deep. It's in the Bible. It seems the first or second hesitations. I'm sure Pastor Ina knows. Um, but I said, God, what's up? And he reminded me that after my accident, I had always said, why me? And I did. I said, why me? All the time. I gave God a list of candidates who were more qualified to lose their arm than I was. Like literally, there was one guy in particular. I was like, God, why not him? Like of all people. The funny thing is that guy's a pastor now. Um, but he reminded me, he said, you never asked me why I let you live that day. I said, okay, God. He said, why did you let me live that day? Why didn't I just die and go on to heaven and be with you? And this is the only time in my life I heard the audible voice of God. And I think God speaks audibly when it's something that you need to know that you know that you know what you're hearing. But I heard it audibly. And it still gets me. He told me, he said, if you would have died that day, you would have gone to hell. And it floored me. I was like, no, God, that can't be right. Everybody in my high school knew me as the good Christian kid. Never got in trouble. My senior year of high school, I took a class. And I didn't know it at the time, but the teacher was a Christian. And she had every one of the seniors that year that took her class she listed, she had a list of 18 things that you had to list rank of importance. One being the most important, 18 being the least important. And it was stuff like make a lot of money, travel the world, have a family, have a high paying job, whatever it might be. And she said out of every student that she had my senior year, only one person put that eternal life and salvation was the most important thing to them. And that was me. But just because... I put that as the most important thing to me doesn't give me eternal life. Just because everybody knew me as the good Christian kid doesn't give me eternal life. Just because I went to church three years in a row doesn't give me eternal life. Going to McDonald's doesn't make me a Big Mac. Going to church does not make me a Christian. It just makes me a church goer. So when God spoke that to me, it scared me to think that I could be burning in hell right now and then I got scared for a different reason and I was like, God, how many people are on their way to hell right now and they have no idea? So I knew exactly what I was supposed to share that night. So I got up and spoke and another guy spoke after me and we saw 72 young people come to Jesus. And I told God, I'll do this every day for the rest of my life if it'll keep one person from going to hell. And that's what we've been doing. We've seen thousands upon thousands. I couldn't even guesstimate how many thousands upon thousands of people we've seen saved. I, but it, the thing is, it has nothing to do with me because when people respond, they're not responding to me. When people reject, they're not rejecting me. They're responding to Jesus or they're rejecting Jesus. I've led people to Jesus via text message, through Facebook Messenger, in person, on a plane. That's why it's so important for us to share our faith with other people. But that was another prayer that I, I guess it was a prayer, but I said, God, I'll do this every day for the rest of my life if it'll keep one person from going to hell, and that's why I'm here this morning. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
So I'm going to ask you if you would just to bow your head and close your eyes right there where you're sitting. If you're in here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, then this morning is for you. Or maybe you're in here this morning and that one point in your life you've asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, but you've turned your back and you walked away and you know you're not living the way you're supposed to, then this morning is for you too. Or maybe you're in here this morning and you're like I was that night when that girl said, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I think so. If you can't think back to a specific time when you asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, then this morning is for you too. So if that's you on any one of those three things, if you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior for the first time, if you want to rededicate your life to him this morning because you know you're not living the way you're supposed to, or if you just need that no-so experience that if anything was to happen to you that you would go to heaven, if that's you on any one of those three things right there where you're sitting with every head bowed, every eye closed, just slip your hand up in the air. I see those hands. Anybody else? You can put them down. Anybody else? I see that hand. You can put it down. Okay, if y'all would, look up at me for just one second. <clears throat> I saw hands go up all across the congregation, and I, I love seeing that. But there's one thing that Jesus has me do, um, and it was something I started doing years ago at his leading, and until he leads me another way, that's how I'm going to do it. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he did so openly. He didn't say, hey, can I get crucified back over there behind that row of trees? Or can you crucify me on the other side of that mountain so nobody can see me? He died on Golgotha's hill for my ugly sins and for your ugly sins where everybody could see him. He's beaten to the point beyond recognition. He's either completely naked or most of the way. And he did that for me and he did that for you. So I only think it's right that when we come to Jesus or come back to Jesus that we do so openly as well. So here in just a second, I'm going to ask you if you raised your hand, should have raised your hand or wanted to raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to come stand right here facing me. Why do I need to do that? If you can't make a stand for God in church, there's no way you'll ever make a stand for God out in this world. Amen. Well, what's everybody going to think about me? I don't care what anybody thinks about you. Because there's going to come a day when you're going to stand in front of God, your Creator, and it's going to come down to what did you do with what Jesus did for you on the cross? Well, what is, everybody knows I'm on the praise and worship team. I don't care. I've spoken at an event before where everybody responded except for the pastor. It doesn't matter what people think of you. Oh, well. I know Diane, she's got it all together. She's Jesus Jr., like whatever it might be. Like, you know where you stand with Jesus. So here in just a second, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if you raised your hand, should have raised your hand, wanted to raise your hand, I'm going to ask you just to come line up right here so that we can say a prayer together. Don't wait and see who else is moving. You get up and you move because you're making the decision that you want to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. So on the count of three, come line up right here. One, two, three. Y'all come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.